Hello, good evening, Falcha. Welcome, Cade Mila Falcha. 100,000 welcomes wherever you are in the world. Welcome to Live Irish Myths. I'm Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. Tonight, we are on episode number 61. Yes, that's 61 continuous consecutive episodes beginning on March the 12th at the first restrictions due to COVID-19. Hope you're all keeping safe and well and socially distancing and doing all the things that you need to do to maintain your good health and that of your fellow inhabitants. Tonight, or this evening, we are talking about Cygnus, the constellation, the swan constellation, and more specifically, something I call the Cygnus Enigma. And I hope you're suitably, uh, what's the word, um, suitably excited, perhaps, uh, in anticipation of tonight's subject. Well, anyway, you're all very welcome along, as always. Uh, on YouTube, the first of the commenters tonight is Erica Bau, uh, who says, good afternoon from sunny Texas. Hello, Erica. Uh, Zandru Reguera says hello from a cloudy Buenos Aires. Falcha Zandru. Mandy McCurl is uh, in a, a cold and breezy Isle of Mulbert. Uh, says hello to everybody. Falcha Mandy. Erica Rivertree says Bannachty, O Louisville, Kentucky. Finished errands in time to get home for today's Mythflix and to make a lasagna, which is now in the oven. Oh, nice. Connors to talk to August Chach Vorku. We're all in great form. And thanks for asking, Erica. And I hope. You enjoy your lasagna. River Faye says, hello, everyone from Western New York. Chill chill and rainy here. A great day for Mythflix and coffee. We've had a sunny day, but it's been breezy and very cold. Can't believe the change in temperature since Saturday. But anyway, it's to get warmer again. John Main says, hello from San Francisco, where it's cold again today. Anthony, the name of the book yesterday that people asked about was Shumas McManus, the story of the Irish race. Okay. And I do apologize because when the question was asked, I actually didn't know uh, which book was being referred to. So I'm sorry about that. Sometimes I see uh, comments that, uh, well, the comments, there's usually a lag of at least a minute or so. And so sometimes I see comments and I'm scrolling up and I'm seeing comments that relate to something that was said five or 10 minutes previously. Natty Lopez says hi from Argentina, as always. I hope everyone's keeping safe. Jiglich, Natty, lovely to have you along on Facebook. Ben Hancock is tonight's first commenter, says hello, clan. Giorgive Tua and uh, Giorgich Ben. Aaron Durrett is watching. Hello, Aaron. Heather Geron Rice said, made it excited about Fornox. Who said we we're going to be saying anything about Fornox? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Don't give it away. No spoilers, no spoilers. Barbara Barney says, hi, Anthony. Hello, Barbara. Terry, Le Terry Lynn Zaharias says, uh, oh, here, just in time. Hello from Colorado. Falcha Terry Lynn. Yvette Tillema says, hi, Anthony. Very eager to hear hi to all the new friends. Indeed, lots of friends being made on here. Hello, Yvette. Aaron Durrett says, yes, there may be, there may now be 100,000 of the two. Uh, congrats, Anthony. <laughs> ah, who knows, yeah? Uh, brilliant stuff. Hi, Aaron. Jules Cousin says, hello, everyone. Gia Gwich. Guido Bruce is watching. Falcha Guido, nice to see you. Margaret Ring is in the house. Good evening, Anthony, and the lovely Tua. Always a great pleasure to see you, Margaret. Patricia McAteer is watching, and I'm sure she'll comment in a moment. Nick Eska Casterton says, hope you and yours are doing okay. Hello, Tua. Hope you're all okay, too. All doing fine by the looks of it, Nick. Brilliant stuff. Guido says, hello, Falcha. Judy McQueen says, hello, Gia Gwich. Lucy Robinson says, evening, Tua. Tranonawa, Lucy, what lovely to have you in the house. Ralph Waldron, hi to all the Tua. Feel like I know them all now. Exactly. Isn't it lovely? Cheryl Ann McFetridge says, cheers and love from Boston. And lots and lots and lots of Irish people in Boston, of course. Cheryl Ann, great to see you. Good evening, Tua, says Henry Paddy Shearman, who's in the house again. Uh, Tranonawa, Henry, Kristen Gray Taggart says, hi, Anthony and Tua, still catching up on this weekend's episodes, but looking forward to hearing about sickness today. Brilliant stuff, Kristen. Louise Cheryl says, hi there. Geoglitch, Mike and Jeanette in Princeton are saying hello in Princeton, New Jersey. Falche, uh, Geoglitch, and uh, it's lovely to see you as always. So excited for this one, says Scotty Farrington. So excited he is that he's spelt it all in capital letters and put some lovely... Uh, hearts and an Irish flag and a shamrock at the end of it. Yes, Patricia McTeer is waving now and saying hi all. Gia Gwich. Uh, Patricia, hope you're well. And of course, Patricia's in County Louth. Hello from Colorado, says Demi Wo. We're having a nice soft rain. Good for the grass and plants. Well, exactly. And we have planted a lot of flowers and grasses 
uh, and uh, we have some trees as well. And they needed the rain. So they're not complaining. Melanie Lynn is watching. Falsha. Hi, Melanie. Eva Anderson says hello from sunny but rather cold. Nine Celsius Gothenburg. Interesting, Eva. I was out in the car a short time ago dropping the two girls somewhere. And it said nine degrees. So snap. The Swan Comet is going to pass through our skies on my birthday, says Aaron. I've been watching this one. Looking forward to seeing it. Hopefully it lives up to its billing. It's supposed to be nice. Marta Benito says, hello, like that with loads of O's. Falcha, Marta, <laughs> Ben Hancock, Lear approves today's lesson. Ooh, I'm glad to hear it. Serena Swift says, hello from beautiful, warm uh, PNW, Pacific Northwest. For those who don't know, Washington, brilliant Serena Falcha. Chris McCann, Giorgiv, Antonellis, too, are from on Lorgan Ardvaca. That's Lorgan in County Armagh. Was reading a book on Native American music and stories today. And this line reminded me of what you're doing each night. Thought you might appreciate it. Quote, let us pause in the stress of our modern life to listen to the ancient lore of our own land. Unquote. I absolutely love that, Chris. Yes, I love it. And thank you for sharing it. That's really wonderful and aptly describes what we're doing. Thank you. Goramahagat. Nora Gaffney O'Connor says, Ken Koya Vilshiv. Well, I'm in fine fettle, Nora. And I hope you are too. Lots of YouTube videos today after my sea swim. Very wavy. So enlightened. Brilliant stuff. Freya Shoholm says, Trinonawa Antoam August Tua. Falcha Freya. Kathy Maydayo. Good evening, Mr. Anthony and my fellow Tua. Sunny again today in Newcastle in Washington State, USA. Washington State. I'll tell you, that's where it's all happening. First place I'm going to uh, when things, when, when we're able to fly again. I'm going to see all my friends in Washington State. Sharon Boggan Stitch says, Hello, Anthony and Tua. Hope you're all well. Investors missed a few live episodes due to pressure of work. Glad to be able to join you today. Raining here in Reading, California. It's lovely to have you back, Sharon. Always a pleasure. Doris O'Hara says, Hi, Anthony, and all heavy rain and cold in Heidelberg today. So we seem to share this theme quite often. Whatever the weather is here in, in the Boyne Valley, it seems to be shared by about two thirds of the viewers. It's fascinating. Desiree Riley says hello to a got my funky wisdom tooth pulled. Can't say it feels better at the moment, but at least it will start getting better. Thank you for all your kind words, thoughts and prayers. Get well soon, Desiree. Banachthi. Movanachthort. Liz Pierce says hello. Geoglitch, Liz. Mariana Dunn says hello, Anthony and dear Tua from Virginia. Fortune, Mariana. Laura McCormick says, yo, from a cold but sunny Killinall in South Tip. Greetings to Anthony and the Tua. Hugs to all. Keen to share more wonderful stories and learning. Great stuff, Laura. Rowan Grove says, hello from a chilly, rainy Colorado. <laughs> Pardon me. Well, we had the chilly, but we didn't have the rain, thankfully. And welcome along, Rowan. Tom King is in the house. Good evening, Anthony and fellow Tua. Another lovely day to finish off and to finish off story time. Tom, it's lovely to see you as always. Eugenia Whelan is watching and she is in Drechad Aha, one of my fellow Drahidians. Uh, uh, Eugenia, always a pleasure to see you. Kimberly Fields Sipala says hello, Anthony from Washington. Looking forward to the episode today. Such a fun way to spend a lunch hour. Fantastic. Glad you think so. Saskia Maria. Saskia Maria says hello from Germany. Uh, hello, Saskia. That's the name of my one of my dogs. We had her out for a walk today. She's in great form. Melanie Lynn says, hello, Tua. Storms here. Stay indoors, Melanie. Stay safe. Jim Conway. Sorry, Theresa McGuinness says, another sunny day in North Florida. Hello to all. Florida, I tell you, that's where it's at, Theresa. Lucky you, huh? Jim Conway says, Gia Gritch. Hello, Jim. Nice to have you along, as always. Paula Snow Queen is waving. Fall to Paula. Paudi, Paudi Makavoil says, Hello, Matua, Bergibua, Trononawa, O Glasgow, Alba. And that is, of course, Glasgow in Scotland. Hello, Paudi. Good evening to you. Nick Eska Casterton is glad that Desiree has had her tooth sorted. Carol Paul says, Hello, from Carol in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, USA. Trononawa, Carol, lovely to see you. Lucy Robinson, hopefully it settles for you now, Desiree. See, all oh, people are so lovely on here. 
it's like a whole healing thing going on. Kirsten Salisbury says, hi, everyone. Ternonawa, Kirsten, nice to see you. Paul Nethercott says, hello from chilly Indianapolis. Again, we're sharing the same weather. Hopefully not as chilly as the day we were up at uh, Four Knox, Paul. <laughs> the cold was definitely getting to us all that day, wasn't it? Lovely to see you. Anyway, hope you're in good form. Uh, Robin Edgar is watching. Greetings from Soviet Kanukistan. I hope you will mention the fact that the sun's corona resembles a large white bird during some solar eclipses. The cor this coronal swan is almost certainly inspired. It's almost certainly inspired the myth of Zeus transforming himself into a swan. Well, I don't quite agree with you, Robin, but I do agree that it definitely, yes, indeed, you do see the solar bird during an eclipse. I don't think that's what inspired the Enga story, though, and that's where we will differ. But anyway, it's good to differ because that's where the de healthy debate comes about. Okay, let me see if there's anyone else. Lots of people talking to each other, which is lovely. Rick Garunovich says, uh, greetings from Ohio, chilly and snowy here. Still snowing in some of the states, folks. Rick, lovely to see you and pull up a chair. Imagine you're sitting by a lovely warm fire and, uh, you know, grab a brew or a dram. Federica Guy says, ciao, Anthony Antua, love from Italy. Falcha, Federica, always lovely to see you. Hi, Anthony, and the wonderful Tua from Movanway, Millward. I watched Martin Burns' fantastic video on Stone Age sites today. Great watch. Look forward to the day I can get back to Ireland and explore the sites around Sligo. Yeah, Martin is brilliant. He is a fabulous, fabulous researcher. Pat Rowan is in the house. He is watching Falcha, Mohara, Forig, Conasata, too. How are you? Alwyn Roy Badziak says hello from Reading, Berkshire. I'm looking forward to tonight's episode. So many swans on the Thames here. Brilliant stuff. Mary Cloran says, Gia Gwich Mokharja. Falcha, Mary. Lovely to see you. Thera Hoekstra says, Evening all. Had to skip a couple of nights due to work. That's perfectly acceptable. But glad to be back. And we're glad to have you back, Thera. Pamela Walters says, Banachti from the Netherlands. Glad to be back. Banachti Tosafain, Pamela. Always a pleasure. John McAndrew says, hello, Anthony, from Rochester, New York. Joining a little late. That's perfectly fine. We're only 12 minutes into the introductions, and last night it was was it 26 minutes before we actually got the video going properly. <sighs> That's because I talk too much. Katrina is in the house. Banachti Falje is jocks. Shogoj Katrina. Um, greetings from the far side, says Liam Smith, who must be on the north side of Drada. It's very nice to see you, Liam. Falcha. Hello, Tua Angel, says Pat. Out again late tonight. 105 stops, 120 miles. Have a fun time. Well, come here. Stay safe, Pat. Keep her between the ditches. And uh, good to hear from you. Okay. Okay, I think we're caught up. Helene McCree McGreevy is in central... in. In central coast of California, wishing I knew how to read the stars like my Irish ancestors did. <laughs> Very nice uh, sentiment. Jess Mulligan, hello and best hello and best to all from New York. A little rain and the tree leaves beginning to appear. Looking forward to today's talk. Falcha, Jess. Ashley Smoot says hello from Maryland. Falcha, Ashley. Hark Mill says hello from the Black Forest. Falcha. And... Uh, J McHugh, whose name I can't remember, but it does begin with J, is a Joan. DD from Hoth just completed an 11-hour horticultural exam with just a 15-minute break, and I'm shattered. Relaxing now with Vino. Hello to fellow student Kleena, who follows your page. Wow, 11 hours? My God, that's something else. So what are we on? What are we on? Now let's have a look. Get my notebook. Take a note in my little black book. This is episode, what is this, episode 61. And let's call it 14 minutes. So just to say, as uh, I regularly do, but not always these days, to thank the patrons of Mythical Ireland who support the Mythical Ireland project. And uh, that's over at patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland, where if you were interested in supporting what we do, there are rewards for your patronage. And just to say a special thanks to the new patrons this week. So we're tonight talking about the Cygnus Enigma. Now, I don't, like last night, I don't need a book for this. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is one I can do entirely off the cuff. 
Um, the thing is, I have to be careful. I don't think there's anything too complex in terms of the astronomy uh, today. Uh, so I know I know that uh, last night uh, was a bit of a whirlwind. <laughs> and I do apologize for throwing so much information at you all and expecting you to, to, to digest it all. Uh, but as I said, there's lots of material on the website and in some of the videos and in, and in my books, of course, don't forget the books. If you're interested in the astronomy, Island of the Setting Sun is the book that you really want. It's not available as a print copy except for secondhand and a lot of the secondhand copies are very expensive. It is, however, available for Kindle on Amazon for $9.99. Uh, and it is a full color PDF version. So if you have, for instance, an iPad, uh, you will be able to display the book in all its wonderful color with, you know, exactly as it appears in print is how you will see it on your screen. In the meantime, there's something else I wanted to mention. Um, I'm out of copies of Mythical Ireland. As soon as I am able to get copies from the publisher, I will do and I'll let everybody know because that's the one that's mostly in demand. I do have lots of copies of Dronehenge and I have lots of copies of The Cry of the Sebok. If you want to support my writing, go over to the website and go into the shop. And if you want to buy, you will get a signed copy of one or other of those or both if you're so inclined. It's always nice just to add that in that if you want to do, if you do want to support what I do. And uh, the reason I was nearly late tonight because I was writing uh, this evening after work and um, I was really, really in flow. And I got so into flow that, and I was using my typewriter to, to type, that um, it, it was suddenly three minutes to eight, and I realized I had to clear the typewriter away and get the tripod set up and get the phone set up and get the webcam set up and everything. I was nearly late, but there you go. Cygnus Enigma. What is this about? Well, let's see how we can connect Whooper Swans and Newgrange and Fornox and the Swan Constellation of the Sky and how that all might link up. Where do you start? So it starts in the 1980s when Richard Moore, my good friend and co-author on Island of the Setting Sun, there's his name on the cover, Anthony Murphy and Richard Moore. Myself and Richard have been good friends since January of 1999 when I first met him. Well, actually, I had met him before that on the street when he was painting. But that was the time we became properly acquainted, shall we say. And so in the 1980s, Richard was painting out in the Boyne Valley, as he often did and often still does. And he said that he noticed uh, at Newgrange Farm down in the fields in front of Newgrange that he saw what he initially thought was a group of sheep. But then he saw that they were very bright white. They were very clean looking sheep because, you know, these sheep are generally sort of like a, an off white and a dirty white. And uh, he uh, I'm not sure if he grabbed a camera or binoculars and looked through one or the other. And he saw that, in fact, there was a very substantial flock of swans down on the fields. And that was the first time he had seen them. And so it was when I met Richard in 1999 and thereafter, when we really sort of got going with our researches, that um, we started to uh, investigate the ornithological sources about the whooper swans. So these were whooper swans. These are not mute swans or Buick swans. The mute swans can be seen generally in pairs on the River Boyne all year round. The whooper swans, however, migrate here from Iceland in the wintertime. They arrive into the Boyne Valley in October, roughly mid-October, or that certainly they used to the patterns have been changing as the as the climate has been changing and they generally migrate back to iceland again uh, sometime around mid-march now the fascinating thing is anything up to twenty thousand birds arrive in ireland and they all arrive on the coast at donegal which i've never seen but apparently is a really spectacular site todd despera is in the house says hello anthony over in falcha tom good to see you josephine Meehan says hi anthony and tua late tonight don't worry josephine we're just literally starting Sorry. I don't think it's that, Richard. Katrina, I can't follow your link. Hang on. I'm going to see if I can follow it here on the... I can't open it up on the phone. See if I can click on it before it disappears from... I don't think it's that, Richard. It says more Richard William. Uh, not sure what Richard's middle name is, actually, funnily enough. It's funny that you mention it. Let me have a look. Mouth of the River Boyne. That looks like Richard's work, all right. Marsh Road, Drogheda. Yes, that's 
that is the same Richard. There you go. Yeah, they're his paintings, Katrina, some of his er er earlier work. So um, they disperse from Donegal into groups, and the ornithologists or the bird watchers, the ones who keep an eye on the bird populations, tell us that anywhere where you see regularly see 50 or more birds wintering, that is what they call a significant wintering ground. Yeah, sorry about that, Megan. I, I should, when I'm blowing my nose, I should maybe turn this way rather than, you know, nobody needs to see the uh, the fleas and the nits in my hair. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> and um, so it turned out that Newgrange Farm has been a significant wintering, wintering ground for the Whooper Swans as far back as modern records go, which is back to the 50s or the 1960s. Um, and they certainly had been seen uh, before that. Now, of course, our contention would be that they've been coming there for a very, very long time. And so this got Richard very interested in the idea of the swan because he immediately thought of uh, the swan constellation of the night sky, which is the one that we know as Cygnus. Um, we can't, of course, for certain or with any level of certainty, say that the ancient Irish astronomers and the farmers who built Newgrange and the monuments of the Boyne Valley saw that great cross, that great cruciform shape in the sky as a swan. However, we can make certain suggestions, we can theorize, uh, and I suppose we can hypothesize based on making connections. Uh, between the mythology, the layout and design of the monuments, and the apparent astronomical alignments. I say apparent because it's not, again, always uh, clear whether they were intentional. Uh, I mean, the one uh, about Newgrange being aligned on winter solstice sunrise is um, uh, one that's agreed by all of the expert authorities in archaeology and archaeoastronomy as having been... Um, an intentional and integral part of the construction of the monument. So Richard got to thinking, he said that the Cygnus constellation is this big cross in the sky. And then at Newgrange, you know, the layout of the passage and chamber of Newgrange is such that they are cruciform. Uh, they are cross-shaped. They appear to mimic this shape of the sky as such. So at the moment, uh, at this point in the story, everything is rather vague. It gets interesting, though, um, as time goes on, because very quickly, uh, <clears throat> myself and Richard realized that, uh, and I think it was something that had been pointed out by researchers in the past, but I can't remember who and I can't remember what publication or whether it was something that had been printed in a, in, in a, in a book or in another publication, that Newgrange is aligned in such a way that you know, it, it opens its its roof box, which you've seen photos of yesterday's graphic shows a, a picture of Newgrange's roof box. It's it's shallow, but it's wide, and it covers an area of sky that is several degrees wide. It's wide enough so that the the beam of sunlight that strikes the floor of the monument illuminates that floor for about 17 minutes. So it se takes 17 minutes for the sun to transit the roof box. I think it's several degrees, and a degree is a degree of sky, just to put you in the picture, is roughly two widths of the sun. So the sun would be approximately there or thereabouts, one half of a degree wide. So if you think of one degree, that's two sun widths, and if you think of three degrees, that might be about six sun widths or so. It might be even more than that. It might be four or five. I can't exactly remember offhand, but that information is probably in Island of the Setting Sun somewhere, and I'm pretty sure it is. If it's not in the text, it's in the footnotes. Now, if you were able to magically be able to float out, you know, follow the beam of sunlight from Newgrange, if you're able to magically float out through the roof box and head up into the sky and follow that beam of sunlight, uh, over the hills and far away, as it were, uh, you would come to the Fornox Ridge. And the Fornox Ridge is not visible from Newgrange because there are intervening hills. The first of the hills that intervenes and blocks the view is the immediate horizon of Red Mountain, uh, uh, Rough Grange. And 
that is the hill over which the sun rises on the morning of solstice uh, when the sun shines into Newgrange. And it's very clever the way Newgrange is positioned because, it, as it were, that hill acts as a sort of an, inter, uh, 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 an intervening or false horizon between Newgrange and the distant horizon. And if you were to watch sunrises on the distant horizon, you'll often see that you can look at the sun for the first five minutes of the day and the last five minutes of the day quite safely without hurting your eyes. Because, you know, it is its light is traveling through a much thicker layer of atmosphere. If you think of the sun shining down through the atmosphere from directly above, it's shining through a shallow layer of atmosphere. But if you think of it shining from a, 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 an acute angle, it's coming in through a sort of a, a much greater wedge of... Uh, atmosphere and uh, so for the first five or ten minutes and the last five or ten minutes of the day you can watch the red sun rising or setting with your eyes you can even i've taken photos of it uh, there are people even mad enough to look at it through binoculars without it. now you can't do that uh, after 10 or 15 minutes because it's too bright and too strong and it starts to hurt your eyes now the new builders of Newgrange were clever because they put this false horizon in place, which meant that the sun had to rise off the real horizon in the distance. And then when it cleared the hill, it was already sort of, um, you know, vibrant and shining really strongly because it had risen quite a bit above the distant horizon by about 20 minutes, by the way. The sunrise at Newgrange is, a, is very shortly before nine o'clock. The sunrise at sea level in Baltray is about 8.35 or 8.36 a.m. So there's something like 20 minutes uh, where the sun gets to clear the distant horizon and then come up over Red Mountain. Anyway, the second range of hills that blocks Fornox, even if Red Mountain wasn't there, is the Bellews Town range of hills. Uh, so there are actually two ranges of hills. And conversely, when you're standing at Fornox, looking back at Newgrange, you can't see Newgrange. You can only tell what direction it lies in. Now, uh, Fornox is about nine miles to the southeast of Newgrange. And what I discovered was, using figures that had been given in terms of the azimuth range covered uh, by the window or the roof box of Newgrange by um, uh, uh, Patrick, what's his name? Um, is it? Oh, I can't remember his first name. Is it John Patrick? Uh, in They're given in uh, Professor O'Kelly's book about Newgrange. Um, I just can't remember his, his first name. Um, the figures were given for the width of the roof box. And so I determined that, in fact, if you were to travel out from the moment the sun first shines into Newgrange, its position is there, say, and then from the time it leaves the roof box, its position is there. So instead of thinking of Newgrange pointing at one specific tiny location on the horizon, you're actually thinking about a wedge, uh, you know, like, like a wedge of a pie that covers several degrees of horizon. And it's fascinating because on the Fornox Ridge, there are several monuments and there are probably more that have been destroyed or damaged by plowing or whatever over the years, agricultural activity. But there are two, uh, well, for, first of all, Fornox, Fornox 1, as we call it, which was excavated in 1951 by PJ Hartnett, is one of a trio of small mounds in that part of the ridge. But over towards the eastern end of the ridge, there is a mound with a folly on it and a folly being a, a late medieval a tower or structure built uh, by someone with too much time and money on their hands and and it's called a folly because it served they generally serve no purpose uh, uh, lord netterville or viscount netterville had one on the top of douth uh, which he, he used as a tea house um some sometimes they're described as lookout towers and what have you you know uh, sometimes they were uh, uh, built to employ uh, people uh, who were impoverished uh, at the time of the famine, etc. Uh, and it was a, a, a landlord's or a, a landowner's way of maybe feeding some of the local community uh, who, who didn't have money or, or didn't have food. But there's a folly on this, and I shared a picture of it last week or the week before on Mythical Ireland. It had been taken by, I think it was Pavel Zygmunt, who's uh, breaking light pictures, I'm pretty sure. It was a fabulous picture with the sun setting in the distance uh, of this mound with the tower on it. So anyway, if you were to float out uh, from the at the moment the sun is first shining into Newgrange and you zipped along the in, through the sky towards the sun, you would come to that mound with the folly on it. 
But at the moment, the sun is just about to leave the roof box of Newgrange. After that 17 minutes, you come to Four Knox 1 uh, on, the, on the more western end of the Four Knox Ridge. So it would seem that these two mounds were marking that wedge, as it were, in the distance although they're not intervisible, which is very interesting. Now, I thought uh, at times I wondered whether this was coincidental, but then there are lots and lots and lots of examples uh, all over the country and, and, not, and not just in Ireland of passage tombs or passage graves or, or, or chambered cairns that point to other chambered cairns over long distances in some cases. So, for instance, I'll give you some examples. Uh, the Calivera's house on the top of Schlieve Gully and the Cairn, which is reckoned to be uh, a Neolithic passage mound, points to Loch Crew uh, and specifically to Cairn T for the winter solstice sunset. And, of course, if you continue that alignment, you go all the way to Isle Namir and the Stone of Divisions at Ishnock. Uh, that's a very precise alignment. Some of the Cairns at Loch Crew, according to Jean McMahon, are pointed towards Fornox and the Fornox Ridge, which is, uh, I think, also interesting because they're much, much further away um, from Fornox than Newgrange, a distance, I would imagine, at a rough guess of about maybe 25 miles, maybe 30 miles, 20, 20, between 20 and 30 miles, I would say. I'm not sure what that is in kilometres, up to 50 kilometres, perhaps. So the chances of this, I felt, the chances of this alignment, as it were, Newgrange pointing to Fornox being a complete accident were, I, I just thought, unlikely. Now, it's very interesting when you read um, P.J. Hartnett's excavation report and his description of the megalithic art at Fornox, because Fornox is described as being one of the Boyne complex. Uh, although it is nine miles from Brunebonia, uh, it is definitely built by the same community of people, the same culture of people. They employ the same uh, decor decoration. It, it is strikingly similar in many respects, although it is different in that while it has a cruciform design, it overlaid upon that crucifix is a giant sort of egg-shaped chamber. So in actual fact, Fornox, while it looks tiny from the outside, is substantially large on the inside from the point of view of the floor area of the chamber. And its chamber is about three times. It's definitely at least twice the floor area of Newgrange. So Newgrange is a massive monument with a small chamber. Fornox is a tiny monument with a larger chamber, at least twice the size of that of Newgrange. So when you're sitting in Fornox, and you're looking out, you're wondering, where does this point to? Because it points not far away from north, right? So if you're, if you're sitting in the rear recess of Fornox, looking out through the doorway of Fornox, you're looking at the horizon, that's, you're looking at a point that is about 14 degrees east of north. So if you put north there, Fornox points to there. Now, that is a point at which the sun and the moon, even at the moon's most northerly extreme, and we spoke about that in yesterday's episode, the moon and the sun cannot shine down through that passageway and flood that chamber with light because it points, it is oriented too far northwards. You would have to turn uh, Fornox by, uh, let me think about this for a second, by 20 degrees at least of azimuth before you would be in the range of the maximum uh, range of the, of the moon. You would have to turn it by approximately 30 degrees or so uh, to give the sun a chance to shine in there. Now, Fornox didn't have a, a roof, as it were, uh, like Newgrange, uh, corbelled all the way to the top with stones. Part of the reason for that is because the, the width of the chamber means that to do that corbelling, you'd have a giant beehive-shaped roof on it, uh, and uh, that was structurally uh, uh, impossible. Uh, Hartnett speculated that there were several courses of corbelling, but then the rest was made of timber. And in fact, he found off-centre in the middle of the floor. And off-centre is very important. The reason it's off-centre is because if you were making observations from the end recess, looking out through the entrance, and there was a pole supporting the roof, it would block your view. And this was a substantial pole, by the way. Uh, the the, the pit or the post hole that supported it was maybe a metre, metre and a half wide, something like that. So it's off centre. And he maintains that the top part was was wooden timber. Now, I often wondered, why would you do that? Uh, why would you, why would uh, a complete sealing off of the passage or the chamber not be important. And it's not important, of course, because you're making stellar observations. You're not watching the sun or the moon. Uh, at Newgrange, a great part of what Newgrange does, the sinuous passage, the twists, of the, the bends in the passage and the narrowness of the roof box 
is to try to eliminate uh, the uh, ambient light, that the scattered light that, that naturally occurs during daylight, to accentuate the beam, the golden beam of the sun when it comes into the chamber. And so, therefore, uh, you, you, get, you get the reverse at Fornox, where a short passage, wide chamber, doesn't seem to be important that we block out the sunlight. And that's precisely because it never was designed to look at the sun. One of the things that's notable about the megalithic art at Fornox is that the angular styles predominate, uh, lozenges and chevrons in particular. And the spiral is almost completely absent, except for one example on what was originally a stone from the entrance of the passageway. And this might indicate, it might indicate, because I've connected the spiral with solar movement, uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, it predominates at the likes of Nouth and Newgrange, where it's all about the sun, or a lot of it is about the sun, some of it's about the moon and Venus. But uh, the sun shines into Newgrange. We know that, but the sun never shone into Fornox, so the spiral is absent. But anyway, myself and Richard were sitting there wondering what 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 might pass that way. And so uh, even back in 1999, uh, there was freely available computer software uh, called Skyglobe and SkyMap. Uh, we now use stuff like Stellarium, which is a very popular one. But back in those days, you could reverse the sky. You could reverse time and look back at the sky and see what it was like uh, 5,000 years ago. So. There's a small astronomy lesson coming at this moment in time, and I want you to bear with me for a moment. I'm going to simplify it as much as possible. Some of you know this, but I, I reckon a lot of you probably won't be familiar with it. You might have heard of uh, an effect uh, of the wobble of the Earth called precession of the equinoxes. And I'm going to explain, to, I'm going to attempt to explain this in the simplest terms possible. If you could imagine that the Earth is spinning on an axis, the pole, as it were, the North Pole and the South Pole, that that's part of an axis. Let's just imagine that the pen is the axis of the earth over a period of almost 26,000 years the earth has this wobble in which that axis appears to oscillate like this in a circle so if you're watching it from from above it appears to oscillate in a circle so basically the effect of that is that the pole star of the sky which is marked pretty accurately at the moment by Polaris, or the, the North Star, as we call it, which is in the constellation uh, uh, Ursa Minor, the small bear. Uh, the, 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 uh, the North Pole of the Earth points to a place in the sky, basically. And because the Earth is slowly rotating, it, it, it slowly marks out a circle in the northern part of the sky. Now, this takes 26,000 years. It's a long time. So it changes very, very, very slowly. In conjunction with that, and this is why it's called precession of the equinoxes, the vernal point is the point at which the sun is located on vernal equinox. Currently, vernal equinox sun is in the constellation Pisces. Remember we said yesterday the zodiac is all important because it is the band of constellations through the sky around which the sun journeys on its 12-month uh, journey, along which the moon tends to journey and the planets. Although they're not... They don't follow the ecliptic path exactly, but we don't have to get into that. At the moment, the vernal point is in Pisces. In a couple of hundred years, it will move into Aquarius. Hence, there's a lot of talk, especially among the New Age uh, community, about the age of Aquarius. And that actually comes from Jung. C.G. Jung was the one who coined the whole idea of the age of Aquarius and the changes that he saw coming with it. If you go back in time, if you go back, uh, the... The sun was in Aries for 2,000 years. If you go back to the Neolithic, the sun was in Taurus. And if you go back to the Mesolithic, the sun was actually in Gemini and the Twins. So the sun's vernal point is slowly regressing westwards through the zodiac. Uh, so it, it'll soon be in Aquarius, as I said. Also, the summer solstice, winter solstice, and autumn equinox positions, all of their positions are, are slowly regressing through the sky. That's the effect of precession. The effect in terms of how you see the stars is very interesting. So, and here, here's a very good example. 5,000 years ago when Newgrange was built, do you know that the very small constellation of the southern hemisphere of the sky, called Crux, the Southern Cross, was almost completely visible uh, due south in Ireland, for a very, very short period of time each night, it would rise and you would see most of it. You would see three of the four stars and it would set again. Now, we can't see that anymore. In the Neolithic, Orion, which is currently quite high in our winter sky, was much lower than it is today. In the Neolithic, 
Sirius the dog star, which is the brightest star of all the sky, uh, shone into Newgrange because it shared the same declination as winter solstice sun. But it is now much higher in the sky, so it doesn't do that anymore. One of the significant effects of living in the northern hemisphere, and I, it's the same for the south, but in reverse, is that if you watch the pole of the sky, you will see all of the stars rotating around this central star. Okay, Now, the further away you go from the, that central star, Polaris, uh, the more likely it is that your star is going to rise and set. It rises in the east and sets in the west. But everything forms a circle. And in fact, the way to prove this is to set up a camera with a wide-angle lens pointed at Polaris in the center of your view and take a long exposure of the stars. And I'm sure you've seen lots of those pictures. And you'll see circles of stars in the sky with one dot at the center, which is Polaris, which doesn't move. Old Irish uh, word for that star, according to Charles Valency, who we met in a previous episode, is Miaha, that which does not turn, which is a fascinating name and a beautiful name. So perhaps that's what the ancient Irish called the pole star, Miaha, that which doesn't turn. There's an area around the pole of the sky that we call the circumpolar region. These are all of the stars and constellations that do not set below the horizon as viewed from the, a particular location. The further north you go towards the North Pole, the higher the pole star becomes and the more stars you see all the time that are circumpolar. The further you go towards the equator, the fewer stars are circumpolar. That's, that circumpolar region contracts as you go to the equator, but it gets larger as you go to the North Pole. Now, this is similar for the southern pole of the sky and the southern hemisphere and Antarctica and all the rest. But uh, for the benefit of uh, keeping it simple, I, I'm just going to explain the northern uh, polar region. One of the constellations of that part of the sky is Cygnus, this cross-shaped swan constellation of the night. And did you know that for much of the period of precession of the equinoxes, so, so for most of each cycle of 26,000 years, uh, Cygnus and its bright star Deneb, which is an Arabic word meaning the tail of the hen, those uh, stars are what we call circumpolar. Uh, they do not set. They're visible all through 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 the night. Deneb in particular is visible all through the night, except for this one period of time, this one short period of time, when for a century or perhaps two, a Deneb swoops down and actually sets momentarily due north and then rises again. And that period, of course, was centered in the Neolithic around uh, 5,000 years ago, as it happens uh, around the time Newgrange and Fornox were built. Now, there are no carbon dates for Fornox uh, because it was excavated pre-carbon dates. I'm sure there will be bone material retrieved from that has that was retrieved from Fornox that will be dated in the future. And it's fascinating because the Cygnus is dipping below the horizon and Deneb is dipping below the horizon. And if you're sitting in the end recess of Fornox and you're looking out through the entrance at this point in the far north, you're actually looking at the point where Deneb reappears uh, after its momentary sort of skirting of the horizon. Mello Nello is in the house, says, hi, Anthony, evening to us. Sorry, I'm late. Hi, Neil, fault you. I'm in full flow here. <laughs> Hopefully you'll be able to catch up on the rewind. Uh, on, on the on on the Mythflix later on YouTube or whatever. Um, so I thought this was significant. You know, the only other constellation or grouping of note that is aligned so that it would be appearing in that sort of doorway in that view in Fornox was Cassiopeia, and I thought that was very interesting. Martin Brennan pointed this out because of the predominance of angular art and the chevrons on the stones of Fornox. He thought that might be significant, that uh, Cassiopeia was a constellation that might have been targeted also, and I don't dispute that, uh, and I, don't, uh, I think that's a very, very valid observation. So Newgrange points to Fornox, and Fornox appears to point to the place where the star Deneb was reappearing. Uh, at a time when... It was very specific because at a time when the monuments were built, this was a time when certain specific things were happening in the sky related to procession. So the first of them is that Deneb was setting momentarily in the north. The second of them is that Sirius, the dog star, uh, shared the same declination as winter solstice sun. So any monument that was precisely aligned on the winter solstice sunrise would also be precisely aligned on the rising place at night of the brightest star of the sky, Sirius, the dog star. But then it got deeper than that because Richard said, do you know there's swan mythology associated with 
Newgrange. I said, oh, right. And this is 21 years ago when Richard kind of sowed that great love of mythology in me. He, he, he planted that seed, you know. Um, he came to me because he wanted to learn about astronomy. And as it turns out, he was very knowledgeable about mythology. And so um, we bounced off each other and we learned a lot from each other. And he told me about Ashlinga Ingeso. And of course, we've done an episode of Ash about Ashlinga Ingeso uh, much earlier on. Uh, I'm just going to go back to the blog page where all the episodes are uh, embedded. Yeah, uh, episode nine was about Ashlinga Ingeso, the dream vision of Ingeso. And I'll give you a very, very, very shortened version of that. Ingus uh, is in Newgrange and uh, he has a dream uh, of a, a beautiful maiden comes to him in his dream. He tries to embrace her and she disappears. This happens for several nights and he knows that she's real and he pines for her love and he becomes lovesick. Uh, so lovesick, in fact, that he stops eating and he starts wasting away. Eventually, his parents, Dagda and Bowen, become quite concerned for him and they enlist the help of Dagda's brother, Bov Jarug, uh, to try and help find this maiden and to unite the two of them and this, that this may cure Angus's uh, lovesickness. Uh, Bov eventually finds the maiden and comes back and says to Dagda and Bowen and Angus that the maiden is a changeling, that for one year she is a human woman, and for the following year she transforms into a swan, uh, and vice versa. Uh, and this keeps going. And that he has found her at a place called Loch Bale Drachon, which apparently means the uh, lake of the dragon's mouth in County Tipperary, and that Angus must go there and must pick her out. Angus goes to the shore of a lake, there uh, of the lake there sorry and he sees uh uh i think it's thrice 50 generally you know this number that keeps cropping up in mythology thrice 50 which basically means a uh, a whole a whole load a lock uh, as they might say in some parts of ireland a lock an undefined quantity uh he, he sees a, a, a several uh well 150 swans on the lake and yet he is apparently instantly able to pick out Care, this uh, lady who has appeared to him in a dream. Uh, and Bov had told them that her name was Care, C A E R. Shape shifting, a common theme in mythology for swans. Katrina is absolutely right about that. Yes, 100%. Uh, and so he calls her and she says, Who is calling me? And he says, I am Angus. And so she comes over to the shore and she says to Angus that in order to have her love, he must transform into her form. He must take her form. And so Angus, the story goes that Angus transforms into a swan, that the two of them alight from there, sorry, they take off from there, uh, and they fly to Brunabonia, where they circle the place three times. They put the inhabitants of the Boyne Valley to sleep with their enchanted music, and then they fly into Newgrange, and that's where the story ends. Presumably, they live happily ever after. And this is fascinating because there's a story that definitively links Newgrange with swans. It's not the only one. There's another very significant story uh, pertaining to swans and Newgrange, uh, which pertains to the birth, uh, the miraculous birth of Satanta. And of course, uh, Angus's own birth was miraculous. And I think we've covered that in several of the episodes, or at least we've discussed it. Um, Satanta had a similar uh, begetting when uh, uh, Konkovar or Krohor Magnesa. Uh, was trying to drive away the swans from Awan Macha in Armagh um, with his sister Dechtene. And uh, they came south and eventually they, they came to the Boyne uh, where they landed a night overtook them there and it started snowing. So we know it was winter time. And they went into uh, it was a, a stable, I think, or some sort of an empty building or a stable. And um, <clears throat> basically what happens is that Lou, the god, uh, the sun god or the you know, the Lou Law Fada, Lou Samuel Donak, Lou MacEthlin, Lou Lonenschleck. There are five different names for Lou. Uh, there are four that I can remember immediately offhand. Lou, McKe uh, Lou, Lou McCain, isn't it? Because McKean is his father. Uh, he comes to her in a dream and he says, you're going to have a baby. Think of uh, Mary and Joseph and the Holy Spirit. And uh, Soltum is uh, Dectinus. Uh, real earthly husband Lou says you're going to have a baby um, 
and you're going to call it Setanta. And Setanta, of course, as we saw in some of the tales, is the one who defeats or who kills the Hound of Cullen and becomes Cú Cullen and who ends up being centrally important to the great epic Tornlo Cúlinga. Anyway, I digress. That's the other story of swans. They're chasing swans to Newgrange. And of course, there are lots of swan myths. We 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 told the story of the children of Lear over at least two, or perhaps it was three episodes uh, a while back as well. Uh, two episodes, four episodes, fourteen and fifteen were about the children of Lear, and so we we began to see uh, that perhaps this was in an in an intentional alignment, inspired by the actual swans who were landing in the Boyne Valley. The farming, the farming astronomy community who had built the monuments perhaps constructed the passage and chamber in the shape of this swan of the sky, uh, which they saw uh, as being uh, very important. Now, the swan of the sky is very interesting, the Cygnus constellation, because it is one of the few constellations that appears to be embedded in the Milky Way. And that's fascinating. And the connection there with the Boyne, of course, is that... Uh, the Milky Way is Balach na Bofina, the way of the white cow, or Bohar na Bofina, the road of the white cow. And uh, the river Boyne is Awen Bofina, the river of the white cow. They can basically be seen as uh, uh, reflections of each other, uh, a, cosmo a cosmology that sees the earth, uh, or the heavens being reflected on the earth, uh, heaven's mirror, so to speak, as above, so below, and all that. And so if you are watching the swans, you see that, you know, well, they like to hang around near water. Uh, they like, apparently, the reason they come to Ireland is, first of all, it's warmer than Iceland in the winter, but secondly, because there's more grass and there's more, basically, more forage for them to eat. But they use the river to land and to take off. And if you've ever seen swans landing and taking off, you'll see that... You know, you can think of the analogy of an aircraft, and of course, aircraft, modern aircraft design, uh, are designed on the principles that we see in bird flight. So, if you see a swan coming into land, you'll see the legs go down and and out with the with the feet forward. That's the landing gear engaged. You'll see the flaps go down, the the, the rear feathers of the wings go down, and they sort of glide in, and then they step on the water for a little bit, and then they're suddenly down. They take a long time to take off. If you've seen that, it's very interesting. It can take a swan a 100, 200, 300 meters to actually get off the water, you know, and it's it's got a long takeoff run. It's just like watching an aircraft, you know, slowly starting to move down the, the runway and it takes a few minutes, it takes a couple of minutes for it to get airborne. And it, they need the river to do that. And of course, the Boyne would have been their immediate water source. Now, there are uh, ponds, circular ponds uh, down close to the river, between Newgrange and the river. Uh, not far from Drone Henge, uh, which are reputed by the archaeologists to be what they call ritual ponds. They think that it's likely that they uh, they they were built uh, by humans, that they're not naturally occurring ponds. And there are two sort of conjoined ponds that they almost look like a, a sort of a figure of eight, um, again, close to the river. And that is one of the areas that the swans uh, would sort of congregate. Now, they don't come to the area uh, in the same numbers that they did in the 1980s. And I think part of the reason for that is probably agricultural activity. They like quiet. Um, uh, and there's another... Uh, field with a lake in it not far from Nouth that they have kind of been more inclined to congregate around in recent years and that's where I've seen them in the past five or ten years. Now the story gets even better than that because at the moment Deneb is rising from the horizon after its momentary sort of uh, uh, disappearance and this momentary disappearance might have lasted maybe an hour or maybe perhaps even a couple of hours. Um, this is very interesting at the moment so put yourself in the rear recess of Four Knox and you're looking out through the entrance and you're looking at the distant horizon and you see this star beginning to rise up and you're like oh, this is very interesting this is the return of Deneb whatever Deneb might have been called in prehistoric Ireland perhaps Cygnus was called Angus perhaps Cygnus was called Care. Swans are being are described quite often in, in the tales as being linked with a silver chain, which is very interesting because that silver chain is perhaps the Milky Way. And there is another bird constellation very close by, which is Aquila, the one we call Aquila the Eagle. And I wonder whether in 
prehistoric times or in early uh, times, <clears throat> those two bird constellations connected by the silver chain were in fact seen as Angus and Kerr, and I'm not sure in which order, one or the other. But at the moment Deneb is rising, something very interesting happens related to precession of the equinoxes, related to visual astronomy, something that you could see then but you can't see now precisely because precession has continued to change the way the stars appear to us. And that is that the Milky Way, which we in modern times only ever see half or, or maybe two thirds of it in one sweep. We sometimes see it as a big arc. The best times to see it are in midwinter because it runs down from Cassiopeia. It runs down uh, through uh, Origa uh, between the horns of Taurus and the feet of Gemini uh, through the hand of Orion and down the left hand side of Orion towards the, the dog constellations. And in fact, the large dog and the small dog, Sirius and Procyon, are located on either side of the river as if they're dogs drinking from the water or whatever. The other time to see the Milky Way is in the summertime, in midsummer, and you have to wait till very late in the night because it doesn't get dark until 11 o'clock or whatever at this time of year. But if you wait till late, perhaps one o'clock in the morning, maybe two o'clock in the morning, you'll see the Milky Way as a bright band running down through Ophiuchus, uh, running down to this to, to that area between Sagittarius and Scorpius in the in the winter area, the place where the sun would be located at winter solstice. In the Neolithic. So if you think of a, 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 a ring, right, I'm going to try and demonstrate this. If you think of a ring, right, and a flat surface like that, and put yourself at the center of that, that ring is on the horizon. You can see the whole of the Milky Way at the moment Deneb is rising in the Neolithic. Now, in modern times, that ring never settles. It's like the ring is spinning, right? And it, it never actually settles. It's all the time spinning in such a way that only a certain portion of it is visible to us. And that's because of precession of the equinoxes. But the peculiar fact, as I said, pertaining to precession at the time Newgrange was built, was that uh, Deneb is setting momentarily in the north. And when it rises again, the Milky Way is visible as a band of light all around the horizon. Now, this is interesting because the monuments of the Boyne of Brunebonia are surrounded on three sides by the Boyne, and that is the earthly Boyne, the Awinbo Finna. Let's think of that as the river, or uh, the, the earthly version of the Milky Way. But also don't forget, Newgrange was topped or surrounded with quite white quartz. And I wondered whether they weren't trying to replicate this Milky Way, this Milky River, uh, this river of milk. Think of the story of Glasgovnan, the magic cow, or Glasgovlin and the the Kalyak or the old woman who put the uh, who put a sieve under it so that it's it's milk turned to a spray of droplets and i wondered in island of the setting sun if that wasn't a reference or perhaps a perhaps some sort of an origin myth for how the milky way was formed into these fine this fine spray uh, of individual droplets rather than being seen as one big sort of um, flow of milk as it were So back in the Neolithic, if you were, say, for instance, sitting on standing on the top of Newgrange on that sort of flat platform on the top of Newgrange, you would have a terrific view of the horizon unhindered by, well, first of all, trees, because the, even the mythology tells us they, they, they knocked the trees to build the monuments and they needed to because they needed views of the horizon. You, you're unobstructed by the atmospheric pollution and especially the light pollution that we suffer from today. It's very, very difficult to see uh, the Milky Way and the fainter stars in, in many, many uh, city areas and town areas and brightly lit areas, uh, many urban situations in the Western world. <laughs> now, there are dark, dark sky sites. One of the darkest sky sites in Europe is actually on the Ring of Kerry at Waterville. Uh, in southwest Ireland. And there's another dark sky site uh, for which a visitor centre is opening in the Sperrin Mountains in, in, I think it's in County Tyrone. Um, I think that's in progress and I think that's going to be opening uh, in the near future, uh, COVID-19 pending, of course, obviously. Um, but by and large, you can't. But back then you had this terrific view. And what actually happened was that there was basically a, a uh, this band of light all along the horizon. So all the way from north, round to east, round to south, round to west, and back to north again for a moment of the night. 
as Deneb is rising in the far north, near near north, about 14 or 15 degrees east of north, you've got this bright band of light all the way around the horizon. And I wondered whether the quartz wasn't a way to replicate that band of light, uh, you know, and, and perhaps the quartz stones representing the individual stars of the Milky Way. Now, even the constellation of Cygnus is sinuous. Uh, it bends, as it were, a, in much the same way as the passage of Newgrange does. Uh, the only way that it doesn't quite precisely fit is that the left-hand recess, as you go into Newgrange, the western recess or the left-hand recess, as you look at it as walking in, um, is... Uh, uh, shallower as it were it's not it doesn't go back as far it's not as deep as the right hand and the end recesses uh, and so that upsets it a little bit in terms of it being an exact representation of the cross shape of the constellation now there are shamanic aspects to that story too um angus you know cracks up basically has a psychological episode stops eating um has visions um and transforms into a swan and the transformation into a creature is a big part of uh, uh, you know shamanic journeys etc etc but the thing is he comes back again and he comes back sort of whole healed <coughs> and in perfect balance uh, because there's a male female partnership there and and uh, there's some jungian psychology there i think the astronomy underlying it is fascinating because it's as if the people who built the monuments were very well aware of the sun and the moon in particular, but they did pay attention to the stars. But what the stars would have taught them is that we're drifting over time, lads and uh, lads and lassies. So, <clears throat> so for instance, at the moment Newgrange was built uh, and 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 let's say it was completed, there have to have been people in the community that said, "That's." They probably knew this already. It probably wasn't a coincidence, but they probably knew it already. That reported that the dog star entered Newgrange and shone its light in there. In fact, in one of the tales, and I have this in one of my blog posts, Ethna, who's another name for Bowen, uh, is said to have entered Newgrange in the form of a dog. And I think that that might be cryptic or uh, symbolic language for the shining of the dog star into Newgrange. But say a century after Newgrange was built, around about a century after it was built. So I don't know how many generations. They tell us the maximum life expectancy in the Neolithic was 40 and most people died in their 20s. You were dead generally before you were 30. Let's call it four generations. Four generations later, there are people saying, but I remember a uh, great granddad or great granny uh, telling me that her father or her mother or whatever told her that the dog star used to be seen from Newgrange, and now it's not. Now, if you ever wondered about the longevity of uh, oral tradition, well, we only have to give you examples, and we will get to this in another episode, because we have I promised you we would deal with the mythology and folklore of Newgrange, and we're going to do that. They, that may take several episodes. But don't forget the stories pertaining to the people who told the archaeologist, Professor O'Kelly, that the sun shone into Newgrange at a time when the sun couldn't possibly be seen shining into the chamber of Newgrange and certainly hadn't done for at least centuries, if not millennia previously. And, of course, the story related to uh, Joseph Campbell uh, in the 1950s that the light of the morning star could be seen to shine into the chamber of Newgrange once in eight years at dawn at the winter. And that is astronomically very accurate because that is exactly what happens. And so the Cygnus Enigma supposes that the mythology of the sites, the layout and the alignment of the sites and the uh, astronomy all come together in one system, which we call the Cygnus Enigma. We can't prove it. Um, it's the sort of thing that we will never be able to say yes or no. It's, you know, we've proved, we've proved that this is what it is, is about. It is a hypothesis. Uh, there's a, a dose of speculation in there. However, it is grounded on several uh, key facts and truths. Uh, those facts and truths being related to the data that we have been given by the archaeologists in terms of the date of construction of Newgrange and the likely date of construction of Fornox, which is probably at the same time. The astronomical data, which is uh, sound, um, and uh, the mythology. Well, who can say, you know, how old is a story, you know? These myths pertaining to the monuments are often described as medieval myths because they were written down by Christian monks, you know, in the Middle Ages. 
who knows how old they are and what their provenance was and how far back they go into the dim mists of time. Uh, you know, how far back uh, does the story of Ashlinga Ingeso go? Uh, was it inspired by similar tales uh, uh, from uh, medieval Europe uh, where we know that the monks had traveled and come from, etc., etc.? Who knows? Uh, uh, I think that, as we've often said, that there's a, a nugget, a gem, uh, a know, you know, when you break open, uh, when you break open a hazelnut, you know, and you break off the shell, there's a kernel or there's a actually a heart shaped nut in there. And that every story contains that that nugget uh, of truth. Uh, and uh, we've often often said to the point of delirium, uh, to the point of uh, being tired, repeating it. That history is written by the victors, uh, but that mythology uh, is a form of history, as Joseph Campbell said it was. Uh, that is uh, that cannot be discarded. You can never say that a myth. Uh, 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 you can never say for sure that a myth is a, a record of actual events and happenings, or a record of cosmo cosmology. At the same time, you can never dismiss it out of hand uh, and say that it's mere fable and it was just made up for entertainment. Now, I think that covers the Cygnus Enigma by and large. That is it in a nutshell. And, and of course, the hypothesis envisions the idea that the Whooper Swans have been coming there since prehistory, that those migratory patterns have been in place for a long time. Similarly, the archaeologist Robert Hensey, in his book, uh, First Light, the origins of Newgrange discussed the importance of the annual salmon runs in the River Boyne to the people who built those monuments. And of course, the most important myth that we have from the Boyne pertaining to the salmon is the salmon of knowledge. Um, so, you know, migratory patterns, uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm not, there's one thing that I'm not sure of while I'm speaking to you is whether swan bones were ever found. Um, at Newgrange, and I can't remember whether that's the case or not. I'm going to briefly look because I think it's worth checking. There is, at the back of O'Kelly's book, there is an, an appendix which contains a list of sort of, you know, lists and details of pollen and seed analysis, for instance, the faunal remains. Mammals, 116 fragments of dog, 186 fragments of mountain hare, 113 fragments of rabbit, six fragments of sheep and, sheep and goat, two fragments of cattle. I presume this is from the chamber of Newgrange. The interior, as it were, not, not the whole thing. Uh, lagomorphs, whatever they are, 201. Bats, nine. Well, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be entirely without a possibility that bats made their home inside Newgrange in, in past ages. Song, thrush, five. Uh, frogs, one. And then mollusks, several mollusks. There's no mention of swans there. So that's very interesting. No swan bones that we know of. The other thing is, too, Newgrange was opened in 1699 at the time uh, that it was under the, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say it wasn't being minded at all. Or when, when Newgrange Farm came into the ownership or the land in that area came into the ownership of Charles Campbell, who was a Scottish Presbyterian uh, and uh, who, 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 uh, who was one of the planters, as it were, um, you know, after the Battle of the Boyne in 1690. Uh, he came in there and his uh, his uh, his servants uh, were uh, fetching stones to build his uh, farmhouse and outbuildings. And uh, they, they went up to Newgrange to rob stone from Newgrange. And as luck would have it, they started digging stones at the entrance and shortly thereafter found the very heavily decorated curbstone with this beautiful triple spiral design on it. And they found the, the doorway slab and then they found the roof box and the entrance. And uh, at that point, the first of the antiquarians arrived, Edward Clud. And Clud kind of basically must have said to Campbell, don't do any more robbing of stone or digging. This is a very important site. And thankfully, uh, even though in those days there wasn't any great interest in archaeology in the way that there is today, it was more about grave robbing and uh, plundering gold in those days, uh, he, he managed to prevent, uh, or at least uh, seems to have stopped the activities of Campbell and his labourers uh, from depriving Newgrange of more stone. Now, since then, 
in the intervening period for a couple of hundred years, uh, Newgrange was visited by many, many people, a lot of whom left their initials and graffiti, uh, carved their names into the stones. Um, and it has maintained that a lot of whatever potential remains there were in there, uh, bones, uh, bone fragments and other bits and pieces were probably carted off or removed or trampled or whatever, or broken down into, into fine dust over time with the, with the coming and going of so many people. Um, I think that's it. Just going to very briefly flick through Island of the Setting Sun just to make sure that I've covered everything. If there are any questions or comments, I would be very, very glad to have them. It is ten past nine. We've been going for well, yeah. Well, if you if you if you discount or exclude the uh, fourteen minutes, we've been going for about fifty six minutes, which is probably enough. And I'm, some of you, I'm sure, who have been working long days like Margaret, are probably on the verge of falling asleep. I think that's it. Lee Bond, the daughter of Yucky, was turned into a mermaid and her dog slash otter who went into a cave below Loch Ney after its eruption where Yucky was drowned because of the taboo he broke at Newgrange. Fascinating stuff, Jim. What does Lee mean? Lee Bond. Lee Ban? Is it Ban as in woman or is it Lee Bond as in something white? Quite something. We have so many bats around our house every night, says Aaron. Yeah, and funnily enough, um, if you, as I have done uh, for many years, uh, take photographs along the banks of the Boyne in different locations, you'll find at this time of night, well, a little bit later than this, um, when the last of the birds have fallen silent, then the uh, the bats come around and fly around you. I, I think they're wonderful creatures. Those spiral stones just stunned me when I first saw them, says Terry Lynn. Yeah, the uh, the, tri the tri spiral or the triskel on the front of Newgrange. I mean, the triple spiral can only be found at Newgrange. It can't be found uh, anywhere else. It's it's sort of unique to Newgrange. It's very deeply engraved into that stone. It's it's uh, uh, it's like Newgrange was a zenith, and well, Nouth as well, of course, in terms of megalithic art. You know, it's like they reached their peak. Uh, and and uh, yeah, when you've seen it, especially when you see it for the first time, you know, it lives with you long in the memory afterwards. Midden heaps found during excavation. Not that I'm aware of, Henry. I'm not sure about middens, no, like shell middens and that. Melanie Corpy says, hey, from USA. Fall to Melanie. You've come in, I think, towards the end, but not to worry because you'll be able to catch up on the on the on the rerun shortly but it's good to see anyway fault you there are i have to have a, a lozenge because my throat is a bit sore catherine woodruff says there are archaeology finds of bird bones made into flutes that is right was there any swan bones made into flutes in ireland <laughs> I can't answer that for you immediately offhand. I would probably need to. Um, no, no mention of swans there. I think that's one I would have to. Uh, I would have to do some research on Catherine, and maybe somebody else will know the answer to that. By the way, Lear was also said to be the father of a daughter, Fanula, and three sons, A, Fiacra, and Con. The statue in Dublin's Garden of Remembrance is based on the legend of these four children of Lear. Neil is looking for a link. I'm not sure what that link is. That first something related to something somebody commented on, or is that something I can help you with? The Inuit told stories of a strange type of polar bear that was bigger and fiercer than modern bears. <clears throat> and everyone said it was a myth. But they've found bones now, the oral tradition says Megan. I think the most fascinating one uh, that I've encountered is the Aboriginal uh, myth in Australia um, pertaining to two mountains. 
or two hills, two peaks. Um, uh, and they remember, apparently, in their stories, the time when these peaks were part of the mainland, but they're now two islands because the sea levels have risen in the meantime. But apparently the last time they were part of the mainland was something like 60 or 70,000 years ago. It's just incredible, you know. Uh, very soon, uh, tomorrow I'm going to talk about Orion. But very soon, I'll be talking about Mata. And that's a creation myth, and I believe that's very ancient. And I think you'll be very interested in that. And, of course, that's connected all with Newgrange and uh, the Boyne Valley as well. Now, I might intersperse some other stuff in the meantime. I'm waiting for a translation of... I do have uh, Togal Brunia da Durga in um, Cross and Slover. But I'm not always entirely happy with the... Um, the archaic language that they use. Uh, I don't know whether Whitley Stokes will be any better. Uh, I think his translation is available online, but I'm, I'm waiting on one to arrive, and I'll decide then which one I'm going to read. That's going to take two or three episodes, but I know that's one that you've been looking forward to. In a nutshell, uh, Margaret. Ah, uh, uh, yes, indeed. Ben wants to know how many tales were lost when the church didn't want to write it down. The truth about that, Ben, is probably a little bit more complex than you think. And that's because a lot of the stories survived in parallel with what was written down in the manuscripts. This is something that Joseph Campbell and the likes of John Carey and others have written about. It's the fact that the, the, the stories that were being told uh, by country people in Ireland a century ago about Fionn McCool, for example, were exactly the same with very few changes or embellishments as the stories that were found in the manuscripts that have been written down 500 years previously. Uh, so you're probably actually until the famine and, to, and until, you know, that whole period of time when everything changed in Ireland and the, the language died out a bit and the population either died or emigrated over time. Um, you know, there were huge, huge changes. Uh, even into the time of the school's folklore and the Folklore Commission of the 1930s, you'd probably find that a lot of stuff did actually survive. Um, the church it's, It's not so much that the church didn't want to, I, and I don't want to get into this because I know we had a debate before and, and it just, it, I, I just felt it could get very negative. But uh, the important thing to remember is that when the, when the church didn't like what it saw, when the scribes didn't like what they saw, they tried to change it. They tried to humanize or demonize the Daedalans because they couldn't face the fact that they were deities and therefore uh, they would, that would threaten, you know, the belief in the one true God and his son and all the rest, you know. Margaret Ring, I used to have a recurring dream as a child, flying all over the world every night on the back of a swan. Wow. Swan is one of my power animals. Fantastic, Margaret. I remember having sort of flying dreams and floating dreams, but never on the back of a swan. That's fascinating. You might be interested to hear, if you haven't uh, read it before, uh, that uh, that is a feature of the cry of the Sebuk. And I, I, I dare not say any more because uh, I don't want to spoil it for those who do end up uh, getting a read of it. Demonize. Yes, Empire does that, says Katrina. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I still... Which Joseph Campbell book mentions Newgrange, says Paul Blockley. I will show you. And I'll, I'll read it just before we finish. I think we have a few minutes. Well, I have a few minutes. I don't know about you guys. but uh, Paul Blockley uh, asks which book of Joseph Campbell mentions Newgrange. So he did a series of books, uh, The Masks of God. This is Primitive Mythology, and I will read If you don't mind, I'll read this to you. We may end up coming back to this as well, because I think Venus would make a very interesting subject for a, an episode. We may take the Royal Irish Burial Mound of Newgrange as a typical monument of the period and a sign or marker, furthermore, of the reach of the northwestern, di northwestern diffusion. This tomb is the largest of a number in a broad area on the River Boyne. It's not actually now this bigger, but we won't argue with Joseph Campbell because he's brilliant. About five miles above Drogheda, known as Bruna Bonia, Palace of the Boyne. This is the one that's repeated time and time again. Never, I know because it's Nabonia, but they never think of 
the fact that the Boin is a goddess and and the whole place is devoted to the goddess Boin. It's not always about the river. It's about the person. Anyway, and traditionally associated with a mysterious personage called variously Angus Onroa, Angus of the palace, or Angus Machindagda, Angus, son of the good god. The height of the burial mound of Newgrange, which originally must have been greater, is now some 42 feet. And actually, they don't think now that it was was any bigger than, than it is today. Well, the diameter is nearly 300. Originally, the whole hemispherical surface was covered with a layer of quartz fragments, so that, sparkling in the sun, the monument would have been seen for many miles around. Moreover, a curb of slabs, about 100 in number, some four feet in breadth to six to ten feet long, forms an unbroken ring around the structure, and on certain of these formidable rocks, engraved designs appear of zigzags, lozenges, circles, and herring bones, spirals, and linked spirals. A rough and narrow passage, roofed and walled by great slabs, some as long as 15 feet, penetrates the southeast quarter of the mound from behind an extremely handsome engraved curbing stone. And at the end of this tunnel is a cross-shaped burial chamber where the remains of the kings were placed, probably in urns. The relics, however, and everything else portable were removed in the year 861 AD when the grave was plundered by Scandinavian pirates so that today nothing remains but the eerie passage 62 feet long and the chamber 21 feet from side to side and 18 feet in depth. With its curious labyrinthine spirals on the walls and ceiling, an interesting floor stone with two worn sockets where a man might be made to kneel and the still more interesting circumstance that precisely at sunrise, one day in eight years, or at least so the local story goes, the morning star may be seen to rise and cast its beam precisely to the place of the stone with the two worn sockets. The tale may be true or not, but the coincidence of eight years with the period assigned by Fraser to the reigning term of the kings of Crete gave me a shock when I heard it, and here it is therefore for the reader to take or leave as he likes, or to go to Ireland perhaps to prove. And the Fraser, of course, that he mentioned is J.G. Fraser and the Golden Bow. And if you've never read it, The Golden Bow is a fabulous, fabulous uh, scholarly work. Um, but just to mention that I find it curious that Campbell came to Ireland and it, it sounds to me that one of two things happened, that that story is contained somewhere in the Folklore Commission archives, not the school's archive, because I've checked all those, but the, uh, you know, where the collectors actually went to people and discussed, or... I think more likely that uh, when he was here, Campbell encountered somebody who told him that story because he says it in brackets or so the local story goes. What I find very interesting about it, actually, really, really fascinating is the fact that that is never mentioned. I'm after losing the page because I took the bookmark out. Silly me. That is never mentioned uh, in the writings of Michael O'Kelly. Uh, so it, it strikes me that either uh, O'Kelly had never been told this by any of the locals or that he'd been told it and just dismissed it and never thought it had any value. But Campbell thought it had no value to write it down. And that's the only place I've ever seen it written down. Uh, and it's really fascinating because it is astronomically accurate. Uh, there is only one year in eight when the Venus is uh, a bright morning star at the time of the winter solstice when it can rise over red mountain and uh, it's dark enough so that the light of venus can actually be seen in the chamber of the of the monument and then later the same morning a couple of hours later the sun rises and swamps the whole thing with light it is absolutely fascinating but anyway i i, I think that book can be picked up relatively inexpensively on amazon or abe books um, I think you, you probably find secondhand paperback copies uh, rather cheaply if you're interested. Uh, but anyway, that's what it's called. Uh, primitive mythology, the masks of God. Okay. Old Irish for Polaris, Desiree Riley. 
I will spell it out for you in a comment. Old Irish word for pole star, according to Charles Valancy, was Niaha, N apostrophe, I A T H A, which he says means that which does not turn. And that's in my book, New Grange Monument to Immortality. Let me read. Let me read that paragraph for you, just to to uh, to satisfy your curiosity. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed yourselves tonight. By the way, I should say at this juncture, one of the things that is really thrilling lately has been after the thing is finished is to see the number of comments. You guys are chatting among each other so much now. Uh, yesterday's episode was by far the most commented on since the series began. I think there were 640 comments uh, when I checked this morning. And the most I've ever seen is 550. So it's lovely to see that interaction. He suggests the Irish referred to the pole star as N apostrophe I-A-T-H-A, Niaha, from the negative ne, N-E, and the verb Iaham, I-A-T-H-A-M, to turn signifying that which turns not now i wonder whether uh, i'm sorry if i've missed it uh, katrina I'm, I'm wondering if you have an opinion on that uh, and whether he's talking to his backside or what remember that valency was widely castigated uh, by fellow scholars um for engaging in in, in futility and for engaging in uh, wacky theories about linking Irish to Chaldean. But one of the valuable things about Valency was, unlike, for instance, John O'Donovan, and there are criticisms of O'Donovan, because O'Donovan often heard uh, stories about the origin of places and dismissed them. He said, oh, that, that can't be so. And if you believe that story, blah, blah, blah. He was very dismissive. It seems that Valency made a point of talking to the ordinary folk and garnered some very, very valuable and interesting information from them. If you're interested in pursuing that, Chapter 5 of New Grange Monument Immortality is called Valancy and the Armed King. But that's based on Valancy's works called Collectania de Rebus Hibernicus, which are available free to download as PDFs from the internet from I think it's from archive.org or sacred texts one of those I think it's archive.org and you can read all this for yourself antiquarian George Petrie later said of Valency quote it is a difficult and rather unpleasant task to follow a writer so rambling in his reasonings and so obscure in his style his hypotheses are of a visionary nature the quarterly review declared General Valency, though a man of learning, wrote more nonsense than any man of his time. <laughs> oh, poor Charles. And he gets a hell of a hard time. The funny thing is that Martin Brennan, uh, who I mentioned the other night in, in, in reference to the significant discoveries that he and uh, Jack Roberts and their team and Hank Harrison, all those made, was that uh, Brennan in the star, star, Stars and the Stones, or the Stones of Time as it was later reprinted, uh, also expresses a great admiration for Valancy, that he may have been wrong about certain things, but he was right about others, you know, that nugget of truth that we're talking about. Now, let me see what Katrina is saying here. Sine, fall erbe ar iaham. Well, ni is the negative. Iaham, I can't find anything on it. Yeah. Mm. Mm. The funny thing is, there are several other words pertaining to astronomy. Um, Niachta was one. He said that the, the golden number or the metonic cycle was known to Irish peasants as Niachta, which he said basically meant the 19 or either the 19 or the 19th, as in the 19 year cycle, you know. Uh, interesting. Anyway, I think we have pushed on uh, in terms of time. Um, anybody on YouTube that I missed, I, I do apologize. Um, the Woodsies are watching from Monaster Boy, so I apologize. I didn't see your comments. I was so engrossed there now. I'm sorry.
but it just makes me wonder about how much of that information pertaining to Newgrange was actually lost because somebody who had lived in the area and who had a family who had lived in the area had been talking about stories about things that were supposed to have happened and were just dismissed out of hand. Mrs. Hickey, who, um, Anne Hickey, told us Barkin, who was the custodian of Newgrange from the turn of the 20th century up till the excavations began in the 1960s. Uh, she was filmed on RTE, and, and uh, we've linked to that piece on Mythical Ireland several times because it's in the available in the ar in the archives of RTE. She was filmed saying that she encountered a mysterious white woman at Newgrange, which was very fascinating. And again, that's the sort of thing that a lot of scholarly people would just say, yeah, nonsense. I don't talk about, you know, we don't talk about white women. We don't talk about butterflies landing on Angus's sleeve coming in the window. We don't talk about crystal bowers. <coughs> We don't talk about dogs. We don't talk about swans coming to Newgrange. You know, we're here to discern the hard facts. And that's going to be an interesting one for future episodes about um, about Newgrange. Oh, I forgot to mention, um, um, is Vicky is Vicky on? Um, is, is Vicky on? I didn't see Vicky coming up. And if Vicky is on, I'm just saying hello to Vicky and Evan. Hello to you both. Okay. Thank you, Anthony. And to everyone putting the question on repeat, says Maeve, it's so easy to miss stuff. I mean, to be honest, when I'm reading and, and I'm talking, the the comments are scrolling up the screen at a ferocious rate. And if I was to stop and try to read them, we'd never, it's just, it's brilliant, don't get me wrong. But if I'm missing something, absolutely do come back to me and point it out. And that's how we discovered the other night that Vicky was trying to tell me that uh, a lovely connection had been made with Evan. But several people were saying, stop talking and look back at the comment. <laughs> Neachas equals valor. Mm. Coda wants his supper. No, no, he was fed. I think there's somebody out on the street. He, he defends his territory very zealously. So tomorrow's about Orion. Uh, now, it'll be the first of two episodes about Orion. I'm holding one of those till the day of summer solstice. If we're still doing this at summer solstice, which we may be, look, who knows? Who knows? We'll keep going for the meantime. There's plenty of material anyway to, to, to keep us going uh, for the time being. Hope you enjoyed yourselves tonight. Um, don't forget, if you want to ask a question, you can do so afterwards. Send me a private message on Facebook. Ask the question on the Mythical Ireland community on Facebook. If you're not already a member of the community, go there because you can post stuff there. And I'll just paste that in as a link here on YouTube and on Facebook. Or send me an email. And the email address is mythicalireland at gmail.com. I would just ask you to just bear in mind the fact that I'm still working full time and I actually do get a lot of correspondence and sometimes it takes me a little bit of time to get around to answering everybody. But if you have a question and you feel there's something that I said tonight that you want further detail on or that I didn't address properly, uh, feel free to drop me a line. Probably the best thing to do, to be honest, is a private message here on the Mythical Ireland Facebook page. They're the ones I tend to answer first because I'm on the phone and I get the notification on the phone. Whereas for the Gmails, I generally like to be sitting in front of the computer, uh, which is less often. Anyway, in the meantime, stay safe. Uh, that is the Cygnus Enigma. Uh, it is uh, uh, extrapolated or uh, detailed in much more, uh, in much lengthier form in Island of the Setting Sun. As I said, keep uh, an eye out. Uh, as this COVID situation hopefully improves, uh, we may be able to announce a revised date for the 2020 reprint of Island of the Setting. So in the meantime, there is actually plenty of information about it on the web. Uh, there's there's a, a documentary that was made about 17 or 18 years ago called The Cygnus Enigma on the Mythical Ireland YouTube channel. It's in two parts because it was uploaded back in the day when YouTube allowed you a maximum of 10 minutes per upload. Uh, so I had to split it into two. And you'll see that I was younger and skinnier back then. That was before I started eating steaks every Friday night with my wife. In the meantime, uh, stay safe, everybody. Keep washing your hands. Keep your social distancing. Remember, keep yourself safe, that you can keep coming back uh, to us here every evening. And, of course, that you can keep everyone else safe as well. Uh, and we'll see you tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, where we're going to do the first uh, episode about Orion. I'm going to try and mention some mythology and see what we can. Again, I might do that one off the cuff because it's just it's nice to be able to, to have that flow without uh, without reading. Sometimes you're stuck in the book and all the rest. 
And all it remains for me to say is Banachti, Movanacht Orov, my blessings to all of you. A Kolosov, sound sleep, Slon Gafol. Bye for now. I'm looking forward to seeing you all again tomorrow. I'm Anthony. This has been the Live Irish Mits episode Shaska Isahin 61. So tomorrow, 62. Good night. Ichawa. Now, YouTubers.